All right, Thickhawk Productions presents a new series, Friends at Twitter.com. So we're very excited about our first guest, considering this is our pilot episode, it seems fortuitous, preordained even, that we introduce our most talented writer and friend, Paulos, at MythPilot. Welcome. Thank you, Thickhawk, for having me on. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I remember you asked me to come on to the podcast um, almost a year ago, and at the time I was still just considering things. Um, and now I've made more of a decision uh, to start speaking a little more in forums like these. And so, of course, you were the first person who I had to reach back out to. So I'm very happy to be here with you. Well, I appreciate that, and I'm sure a lot of your uh, followers and fans were. Looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say about your writing. I, uh, so I definitely appreciate that. And I understand no, no wine served before it's time, you know. So it seems like it's time. So let's pop it open. So those of you who follow Paulos on the Bird app have no doubt been blessed by his trademark greeting. Good morning, says Paulos of Myth Pilot. We are going to win. So... A very comfy greeting to you, Paulos. Are we really going to win? Absolutely, we are. Um, people, people ask me about this greeting, what it means, and who's we. Um, well, in my mind, it's very simple. We is uh, me and anyone who's my friend. Um, and anyone who goes and participates in that greeting and gives a like or a retweet or generally engages with me in good faith and in any way. I consider that person a friend on on Twitter. Um, and so we're all going to win together. Um, people ask me a little bit more about why I make that greeting. And the way that I think about it is that I'm someone who's embedded in a, a cultural crusade of some kind. I want to see the redemption of the world. I want to see the restoration of justice. I want to see the the reenchantment of the world. And um, you know, these these are things that a lot of us in this corner of Twitter have in common. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're engaged in um, kind of a struggle. Um, there. Are, you know, there are cultural opponents, but then there's life itself. There's, you know, the mundanities that, that drag you down. Um, there's also directed attacks against, you know, people specifically like Ricky Vaughn and obviously people getting fired or doxxed or, or banned from, from their Twitter platforms. Like these are all difficulties, but to me, the most important thing is morale. And so the way that I understand it is that if you have a group of people together who are doing something different, difficult and different, um, and they're in contention with, with other forces that they, they can survive anything, any defeat, any length of time, just so much as their morale is maintained and they all believe and are willing to fight together. Uh, and so that's, that's why I make the greeting. That's how I see it. Yeah, I I think uh I think people really appreciate that. It's very positive. It's very positive. And I and I think you you touched on the idea of morale. Uh, keeping people's morale up, you know, uh, being happy warriors. I think this era, this timeline that we're living in, it's very easy. Very easy to get black pilled, look around and and see things just are vulgar and completely insane and uh i think there's a real tendency to become um like for me i i i have a sense almost of being sort of just um i i fight that as well being black pilled or just sort of uh, uh this is ludicrous it's ludicrous so it's i think it's critical 
to have someone who's who's really cheering from the from from the front lines and saying, you know, it's we are going to win and giving people something kind of a kind of a a, a rally call. I think you've coined the phrase uh, pearl pilled. <laughs> I've seen you tweet this recently. What is uh what is pearl pilled? Oh, that's uh, that's just a little private obsession. Um, I have an interest in the Baroque. I think it's an overlooked period of history. Mm. It's seen it's seen as really a middle period between the medieval world and modernity. Uh, mm. This transition, which um, is not really examined on its own, apart from as apart from an art phenomenon. But I think that the Baroque is fascinating. I haven't found quite found a way to connect it with the general audience. People seem to be a little suspicious of it, especially Americans, because, you know, the fashion is, is very fussy. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it has the connotation of Kings and harpsichord, um, but it's not like that at all. Um, and the, the Pearl pill is, an inside joke on my own part with myself. I read yeah. this book, American Baroque, mm-hmm. which has to do with the pearl trade in the New World in the early Baroque period, just after the New World was discovered, but before minerals started to be extracted from the continent. And so there existed this highly uncertain, fragmented, scatter of colonies about the archipelago and the principal business that they were engaged in was extracting pearls. But what's Mm. so interesting about pearls is that unlike metals, which can be weighed and quantified and measured for purity, pearls are, have endless variety and they're organic in some way. Mm. And so just as the Baroque empires of, of Spain and Portugal had such difficulty in classifying the wide varieties of people who were suddenly being mixed in the new world um, between Europeans and slaves and Indians and, you know, many more besides just new kinds of life that they were not used to administrating. The pearls themselves presented these fascinating difficulties. They were like the NFTs Mm. of their age (laughs) because each one was completely unique and so this is just uh, a subject that I find privately fascinating. And one day I'm going to write about it and find a way to connect it to a larger audience. But that's that's the significance right there for you. Yeah. I think um, I've read in, into this as well. The, the whole idea of a pearl, it's kind of the struggle of the oyster against some antagonistic force that's entered its shell. And so this kind of, you know, the, I think there's a there's a sort of a, a symbol there, of um, it's almost like the oysters turning lemons into lemonade, and what would have otherwise been, you know, a kind of a, a grain of sand just endlessly antagonizing the insider under his tongue, he just sort of secretes a kind of coating and turns something antagonistic into something beautiful and and valuable. So. I think there's kind of a nice symbol there as well for the struggle. Absolutely. Um, and I think there's something to be seen there and being willing to embrace the difficult or the dangerous or the irregular and, and really engage with it in a lot of ways, because that's, that's what was required mm. in the pearl business was to mm. dive underwater to these places where humans don't belong. And then, extract and make value out of you know and and keep in mind that at the time pearls were not uniform they have endless variety of shapes and they would they'd be fashioned into fascinating articles of of jewelry Um, a shape could suggest a ship or the body of a Mm. mermaid or a lady or or an insect and so uh Like clouds in a way, I suppose. You sort of see what you see in it. Yes, they're endlessly malleable. And so their symbolic value is 
is very is very ambiguous in a productive way. Mm. We'll look forward to reading about that when you uh when you when you do publish your work. We'll look for that. We'll all be we'll all be wearing uh as Bap says the Michael Jackson regalia and yes take, taking on a baroque style maybe in our dress barbaric strings of pearls yes hey i'm down so over the next hour or so i'd like to discuss your work your influences your philosophy and then maybe dive into a selection of your own writings and okay. then wrap up the writers workshop turn our attention to life in this vulgar era and in particular about life on the bird app I'd like to celebrate some of our friends and then finish up with a look into the future, which is one of my personal favorite topics, and discuss what the future holds for the myth pilot, for art, and how it is that we're all going to go about winning. Because as you know, winning is all that matters. So, All right, let's ready? do it. Here yes. we go. Let's do it. So, uh, so as we begin the writer's workshop here, in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche identifies three types of thinking or philosophizing. And, and I'd argue that any, any sort of creative or cognitive effort or artistic production generally could be classified according to the following three. So here we go. I've, I've never heard anyone pronounce these. Surely I'm going to destroy the pronunciation. And of course, I'll hear back about it. But the first one, Ganjasro Tagati is the style like the Ganges. Sonichi thought that this style of creativity was uh, of thought and art and output was a constant flow, like a river, like the Ganges River, like a river, constant flowing out. The next style that he categorized or mentioned is Kurmagati, which is to produce or move at tortoise speed, thorough but slow. So this is the guy who puts out an album every five to ten years or so. Puts out a banger, but they're infrequent. And finally, Mendu Kagati, which is, we should imagine, the frog here. And the movement of the frog who takes a giant leap and then sits for a while and appears really to be doing nothing. <laughs> He's dead. Okay. And just sits. Something's happening, but you don't see anything happening. And then suddenly another leap, another jump, another burst of creativity. So which of these three styles do you think best describes your own creative process, your own writing style, or, or maybe you'd prefer to identify your own style and add a fourth one in addition to the Nietzsche three. Well, uh, I should like to be like the Ganges, a constant and wide stream of creativity, but I know that I am the frog and that's how <laughs> yeah. I've experienced it. Yeah. So what you're so what you're saying you'll produce, and then it looks like nothing's happening from Paulo said myth pilot, and then boom another and another. That's correct. The I, I've been you know before our before we sat down here I did a little survey of my work and mm -hmm. just thought about how I produced it and how I began and. The way that I see it is that I was really blessed with a series of lightning bolts, just very strong ideas that revealed themselves to me mm. where I felt that I was impelled in some way to express these. Um, and those that's a very powerful, motivating factor for for writing mm. but what i would also like to do and what i'm doing now is learning how to not simply wait for inspiration but to to actually be more disciplined as a writer and 
you know, there was there was some famous writer, I forget exactly who, who said that I must be inspired in order to write. And so I ensure that when I sit down at my typewriter every morning at 9 a.m., I am inspired. Mm. And so he's he's bringing a, a discipline to his work, which mm. over time is going to result in better expression of the creative muscle. Um, but what what I can say is that over the last year, it, it's been actually very fun to write like that when mm. when you have a strong idea and it's it's a matter of banging it out and doing it justice. It's like being on a roller coaster. It's mm. and the the act becomes easy in a lot of ways. Um, so that you know that I I was definitely the frog in 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 the past year and a half. Mm. It's the tyranny of the blank page when you sit down and you have an idea and there's a billion words in the English language and, you know, pick one and then type it out and then pick another one and pick another and pick another. It's just sort of picking away. A lot of people describe the creative process as kind of a, um, a sculptor that somewhere in this block of marble, there's a sculpture. And it is my job to figure out its contours and to e e faithfully extract it from the marble. Do you, do you have a sense of that or is it a kind of something different? The way, the way that, the way that I've approached this is that I've, learn to become more sensitive of spotting weird little things that stick in my mind. And I find that if I'm thinking about something for more than a few days, and I also find it a little puzzling or strange, or there's some emotion attached to it, that that's worth exploring. But I've had to go through a process of training myself a little bit okay. uh, to be sensitive to those because you can think any number of thoughts through your day, thousands, maybe even millions, and thoughts fly in and they fly out. Um, you know, they're like butterflies. Yeah. And so, and you might, so you might not give anyone the particular weight that maybe it actually really deserves. And so, that's something that I've tried to become more attuned to is just indicators of, of strangeness. Um, and, uh, very, very strong images. Um, I wrote, I, I started writing by actually writing nemesis. Hmm. And, the image that I saw at the time was the Met Gala, mm. which I think was in 2021. It was the first Met Gala that had occurred because they'd shut it down for the pandemic. The thing. Yes. And I noticed that all of the stars were maskless, but all of the attendants were still wearing masks. And yes, that, that's something yes. that really offended me. And then I started that that image stayed in my head. And um, I had this this impulse for justice is like, what if what if they were invaded by 100 men on horseback? Yeah, yeah which yeah. I, you know, I've given away the ending, but yeah. we, we should we should feel free to, to go completely in depth. And so yeah. to me, I, I had that that image of um, that a ball in the midst of a plague year, such that it was, is is a decadence and it demands divine retribution. And so immediately I was thinking of Edgar Allan Poe and Mask mm. of the Red Death. Mm. And I began taking little notes and researching my my intent was actually to submit this to the Passage Prize, and I did. I submitted it to Passage Prize, 
Yeah. And so that was, that was kind of an impetus. It was, well, I have this strong idea. Let me see it through mm-hmm. and let me submit it and see what happens. It, it, it turned out that it was, it was not a prize winner, but I submitted it to expat press and mm-hmm. I was very happy to see them mm-hmm. publish it. Yeah. We're, um, let me back up. I feel like you said that was the first thing you had written. Is that the first first thing you had written? Nemesis. I would say, yeah, I would, I would say so. I, I see myself as a new writer. I. You, you jump straight. You jump straight into the deep end. Amazing. I, I, Amazing. I, I do, I do have, I do have a literature background from school, but okay. I, I was writing theory. It wasn't. I'd ne- I was never writing fiction ever. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's that. That's a great. That's a great gap in English education in in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, although it probably depends on your program. But in any case, yeah, I hadn't. I you know I I wasn't writing for for work. I wasn't writing for pleasure. But the Passage Prize is is what motivated me. I had this idea, and I you know I became very excited about about the idea of of getting into it, and I found it very rewarding. Amazing. Uh, you mentioned that you get up every morning at 9 a.m. and you sit at your, I suppose, at a desk. Is there a particular place that you write or just wherever you happen to be? Well, no, I, I have to clarify. I don't wake up and sit at the typewriter at nine. Uh, the writer who I was quoting did. Ah, okay. Uh, but I was like, that's very disciplined. I do try and write each day. Okay. And do you choose a particular place? Do you have a desk? Do you have, a, or just like wherever you happen to be? Do you carry a notebook? You talked about ideas just flying in. I mean, it's one of the things you know. Every idea is not going to be a winner, but when you're walking around, you're in the supermarket, and you think, "Oh man, that's great! I just had kind of a a revelation or vision." Do you carry a notebook? Do you write, you scribble your ideas, and then sit down later? On my phone, I use the Notes app. Yeah. Yeah. And I have I have a whole a whole stack of these like going it's just called ideas. Um yeah, I've got, you know, I process a lot of stuff on there. Like some of the stuff that I have on there is actually some of the first stuff that I have on there is from when I was writing Nemesis. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, Madonna dressed in Afghan refugee costume. <laughs> um Yeah, human lab meat grown in vats for dinner attendance mm. in masks aubrey beardsley uh simone biles I, I don't think she no she did make it in there yeah she did she's a fan favorite on our side of twitter yeah um but yeah i had i had this idea and then i i did a lot of research actually yes um yes. so the the conceit of the story is for those for for the audience and for those who aren't familiar. So Nemesis is a story about a young woman, a beautiful woman, who is speaking with her therapist, and she has this recurring dream that disturbs her regularly. It disturbs her sleep, and she can't get it out of her head. And so she's speaking with her therapist about this dream. And what she's dreaming about is that she's at the Met Gala and she's a starlet. She's been to the Met Gala IRL uh, Mm -hmm. several times. She's familiar with it. But now in the dream, she dreams that she goes to the Met Gala and it's it's a nightmarish encounter is that rather than experiencing it as a happy occasion, it's it's. upsetting for her and she she confronts a lot of very unsavory characters in in the industry who she'd rather not um and at a certain point in the dream um after dinner when there's usually a performance in the met gala 100 men on horseback stream into the space and if you're familiar with the met gala or if you're familiar with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, the space where the banquet is held is in the Temple of Dender 
exhibition area, which is, uh, I think it's actually called the, the Sackler wing. It, it was, it was funded by the notorious Sacklers mm-hmm. who were, who were the owners of these pharmaceutical companies that, that pushed op- opioid drugs essentially, and um, got so many hooked to Oxycontin and these other painkillers. Um, just sure, really, Pfizer will Pfizer will have its yes. own wing shortly. Yes, and and so these these one hundred men on horseback stream into the auditorium and they proceed to slaughter the guests. They, it, it's a it's a wholesale slaughter, uh, and this is something that I depict in the story. Uh, but the way that she reacts to this is not uh, with fear. But actually, she she relishes it, and um, she she actually has a very significant encounter with the leader of this band of horsemen, and it's something that is is very significant to her, and there there are ramifications from that uh, that spill out into the real world after after she's done giving her narrative to her therapist. Um, and so I, I had this, the, the way that I approached it is that I had this very strong idea about the Met Gala being invaded, but I, I didn't want it to simply just be a revenge fantasy. And so what I wanted to do was tell it through the eyes of a woman and try and understand her psychology um, and try and understand the fashion world and all the circumstances that surround this event every year. And so I actually did a lot of research to understand the Met Gala, to understand the fashion world generally. Um, I actually read Emily Ratajkowski's book. Interesting. Um, where she talks about a lot of the negative experiences that she's had in the fashion industry. And so some of, a lot of those things made it, made it in there. Um, and, you know, I've, I've met people in real life who've, it, and so this was kind of a challenge for me that I set for myself to try and tell it realistically from the point of view of this woman and I've actually met people in real life who told me that they actually suspected that it was written by a woman. So uh, I was going to ask you that, about that because it's that, yeah. that that has to be challenging. I mean, I think you remember uh, Jack Nicholson in the film As Good As It Gets, uh, who asked, uh, how does he write a woman so well? And his response, which is definitely not white-pilled, goes something along the lines of, I think of a man and I take away reason and accountability, but you hold your female protagonist in much higher regard. How do you write for a woman? How do you write a female character? Well, one through observation. I'm married. I have many female family members. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, you, you come to an understanding. <laughs> um, and I think our corner of Twitter um, you know, I don't want to say like the, the red pill stuff, but it, it, it provides a certain realism. You know, I want to temper that with sympathy. I um, noticed that. I think that's very important. Talk, talk about that. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, our, our corner of Twitter, there's a lot of theory about how men and women relate. Um, and there's you know, there's like F. Roger Devlin and Chateau Hartiste and, yeah. you know, and any, any number, like there's, there's reams and reams and reams of this stuff. Um, and these things are communicating fundamental truths, which is that women want a man who essentially stands above in some way. Yes. And that could be in, in many different fields. He could be, he could be an outstanding poet. 
he could be an outstanding rock musician. He could be an outstanding athlete, but women want a man who stands above in some way. Um, and men want a, a beautiful woman who's agreeable to them and who looks up to them. Yes. And then I agree. I agree also the, the other, the second insight is that energy comes from polarity mm. is that men are attracted to femininity and women are attracted to masculinity and the more masculine the man and the more feminine the women the greater the polarity and the greater the exchange um, and the potential for creation and so these these are things that, you know, by by benefit of my upbringing and, you know, having been exposed to these materials and these truths um, in, in our corner of Twitter or just generally the online space um, that I try to express them in, in my writing. Um, but what I, and while I want to be realistic, I. I, I don't like to be cynical. I, I see this as something that that is is deeply creative. The difference between men and women. I, I see the, the the conflicts in many ways between men and women that you know we experience a lot right now. I see these. I see this as something that can actually be overcome. Mm. Um, and that that's a process that's creative that releases energy mm. um and it it's um it, you know it's it's erotic it's creative so and, and that that's something like both of my fiction pieces or a lot of my fiction pieces they touch on these themes um i think i think they're very important actually it's interesting too because there's a there's a the notion that we're fighting our way through something and that when we win that something will change and everyone's attitude will be different. But if we fight our way through in a very cynical attitude and then win, then we're left the situation where we've won, but everyone's attitude is very cynical and burnt in a way and I I really appreciate the way that you have a you present in your work a healthy relationship between men and women, a respect from both sides, but realistic. And it's sort of the idea that let's take on the attitude today, a positivity and uh, graciousness and kindness. <clears throat> and then when we win, we'll already have the right mindset to move forward with something better. Precisely, precisely. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there's difficulties to explore. Um, yeah, in my second fiction piece, Our Private Kingdom, yes. um, there's, there's essentially a breakup that comes out of nowhere and it's, it's initiated by the woman that, that happens a lot, but the protagonist, Michael, um, you know, it's left, the ending is left ambiguous but you can tell that he still has a lot of regard for her and what they experienced together i think a lot of people um, you know, have they, asked you how it tell us what tell us what happens <laughs> does he call her or does he not call her? <laughs> i can i can never reveal that of course not <laughs> of course not you can't because it, it 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 every all of your readers will have a different opinion and if you tell them what happens then you're sort of robbing Half of because it's a 50 50 choice, he calls or he doesn't. Okay, or maybe there's a third choice, I don't know, but maybe how maybe the, the readers are divided equally between those two outcomes. And to tell them one or the other, sort of like, um, you know, you know, you're stealing the ending from the people who were maybe chose wrong, but maybe there is no wrong, wrong answer. Sure, sure, yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, and if you'll interested... go, ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So, so I'm now that we're jumping to this story. So I'm super interested about, and this is just very writer nerd stuff. But um, uh, 
the 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 opening paragraph uh do you mind if i read it sure Go ahead. with your permission i'm reading now this is a little love story a confection a drop of fantasy wrapped in foil for you to savor and experience a small moment of sweetness maybe with bittersweet lingering notes in the way that the memory of, of midsummer is perfected by regret fuck that is so nice it's so nice it's beautiful perfected by regret yeah. man a hell of an opening a hell of an opening why are things perfected by pain by regret well because um when when we go into something especially a romance there's an ideal um and if you didn't have the regret you wouldn't be able to consider the ideal it's mm. maybe like in a landscape if you've built a beautiful building like a temple mm. you actually can't appreciate it in its fullness unless you move to some other vantage point um and maybe the position of regret or of slight regret is is that vantage point it's like the depths of your regret or sort of a measurement of distance between you and the ideal which you hope to achieve in a way yes Yes. So th this is like such an interesting way to begin a story. So you've made use of a kind of a framing technique and a narrative device where you break the fourth wall. Okay. So where you, where you as the writer are, a narr are, are also a narrator and you're directing, you're speaking directly to the audience and you're introducing this. I'm going to tell you a story. So this is a very interesting way to begin a story. And then somewhat courageously you up the ante. And, and in fact, you tell the reader, and here is how you're going to feel. So this is a really interesting way of, of using, and we see this as a kind of a, a, um, a, a, con a narrative convention that originates in theater. You know, So we, we see something similar in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream with Puck's final monologue turns to the audience. Uh, this is, we see it in Cervantes' uh, Don Quixote and, on, and in Chaucer as well in Canterbury Tales. So instead of just like jumping straight into the story, Michael laces up his running shoes or Michael rents a villa. This is a, like a kind of a direct opening. And then there's a, like a one step beyond that, which is this story begins on a summer afternoon. Michael is running. And that's a kind of an implied that you're telling a story. You're, you're confessing that this is, in fact, a story you're telling. But you've actually taken a step beyond that and say, I'm going to tell you a story and a story about Michael. So this is a, a very, very interesting way of starting this story. Do you have any, any may, maybe you've done this deliberately or a reason why you may have done this? Yes, yeah. Um, it's it's inspired by Borges. And one thing that I love about Borges is that all of his stories emerge from this web of rumor um, where he as the narrator is speaking to a friend and the story was related to him by an acquaintance or it has to do with a book that was passed to him um, by a friend of his father. And this is this is very interesting to me because this is how we encounter stories when friends tell them to us. Okay. Is that there's it, it makes it actually a little more immediate and it makes it where you can negotiate a little bit with the narrator. And it's it's even a little bit of respect for the audience because Sometimes I don't like being immersed in a story against my will before I know whether I like it or not. And so when mm. the narrator speaks to you a little bit, um, one, it grounds it in a context. 
and it makes it more plausible because this is something that was told to you directly. It's it's more immediate. It should feel like the experience of someone telling you a story in a bar. Um, yeah, and exactly. There's a, there's a negotiation that can occur as well as well. You know, this is the premise of the story. Maybe I don't like this kind of story. Um, mm. And that's okay. That's how I think of it. It's interesting because you're introducing a kind of like, here, I'm going to tell you a story and it builds as long as the reader continues to view the narrator as an, as an honest broker, that it builds, I think, um, a kind of uh, trust between, Hey, I'm about to tell you a story. And, and, and so like, yeah, okay, great. So you're following along with it. And, and, and I find that, um, a really interesting way to begin the story. I I noticed that the, the story uh, for me, I think begins in paragraph 10. And so um, again, I'm reading paragraph 10 begins. So Michael begins to run. I noticed a shift in tense. All of the paragraphs which precede that line are written in past tense. And at that moment, so Michael begins to run, you've switched tenses. And in this case, the things which came before that have a sense of prologue. And then we jump into the story, so Michael begins to run. And, and, and then all of the verbs, all of the action from then on, it's told in, in simple present tense. So I think that this is a very interesting way of um, some of my favorite uh, books, novel stories are, are written in present tense. And uh, for example, um, Blood Meridian uh, is written in present tense. And it, it to me, the past tense is, uh, grammatically speaking, is this something that's happened, an, an action or event which happened in the past, which is over. It's a completed action and separate in some ways from the present moment. It's done. The chapter is written, the book is closed. And so in, in terms of writing in present tense, and um, present tense, of course, is the idea that it's extracted. It's not, it's not something that's happening right right now. Um, that's a different tense. Simple present tense is a, a tense which is extracted from time. It, it deals with facts or truths and things. The sun is hot. I write in the morning. I live here. I have a dog. These are just factual things, okay? I, I, I eat breakfast or I don't eat breakfast. I eat lunch at 10 o'clock. That's yesterday. That's today. That's tomorrow. So it's always true. So in, in terms of writing this story from the uh, shifting into present tense there, it's like here's a story that you can revisit, which is always true, which you can go back and get into the middle of it, and it's not over. So I think that that's something that, whether the audience understands is kind of like, you know, grammatical uh, aspect to it. It's something that kind of sticks in the mind of the reader. Like I'm jumping into something. I can put it down. I can come back and look at this again. It'll still be ongoing. It's something which is extracted from time. It's not over. And, and it's something that um, continues. So sort of a factual uh, um, uh, uh, type of uh, an idea which transcends uh, any moment in time. So I think that gives a, the story of a real power, which I really enjoy. I appreciate that. I, I, it was a challenge that I set myself out for. For, for this one, I wanted to set myself a new challenge in writing Nemesis. The challenge was to write from the point of view of this woman and in our private kingdom. The challenge was to write in the present tense. And I, I, I wanted to give that sense of immediacy. I think of pre-literate oral culture in, in prehistory, you know, the dawn of humanity, the, the, the childhood of humanity, um, where all information that, 
is about ideas is related to you by someone else who's speaking to you immediately. And there's no other way to access a story except to listen to someone. Um, and also time is, it, it doesn't have the structures that we have for it now with past, present, and future. It's an eternal now of thousands of years of huntering, hunting and gathering and making stories about spirits and things that come into the world. Um, and so that's something of what I wanted to convey. Well, it's, I mean, it, it fits in, you know, you, I remember, I think in your, one of your Substack um, entries, you've, you've discussed what does, and I, and I wanted to ask you that from the beginning, myth pilot, myth pilot. So you, it's a creation of myth, myth, myths, which will continue future myths, new myths. And so the idea, I can open the story anytime and Michael will always be running, always be running. And so it's kind of it's a myth of its own. It's it's it it uh, it 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 elevates it elevates it in a way, which I think is wonderful. Which I th I think is wonderful. I have a, I have a I'm not sure if it's appropriate to guess. I at the end of your story, and uh, you don't have to say the Michael and um, Katerina. Yes, Katerina see themselves twice, once on a wall, which I believe is the permanent version of them, and once in the clouds, which is a kind of transient version of them. And I think the very, very last line of the, sent of the, of the story it gives away the answer of what happened. So I don't know if I'll say beyond that. The folks I got to go and read, those who haven't, will have to read through the story. And I think the, um, to me, Michael lights a cigarette. I'm reading now. Michael lights a cigarette. He holds the letter in his hand, thinks about how to respond, and looks at the sky. To me, that's the answer there. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's better you don't say anything. <laughs> you don't want to give away the answer. Yeah, well, they they see something very real. They have a shared vision. They share an interest in these very old things. The story is set in ancient Greece. The genesis of the story was actually seeing this this image by milo minara um who's an italian artist and these are the illustrations I, throughout the throughout the story is yes? are, are these yes at, at least at least the very first one yes okay and the illustration it's of a man and woman looking up at a temple and beyond the temple, there's a warrior and a woman in the sky. Um, and the whole atmosphere of the illustration is is dreamy. It's done in watercolor. It, it, it has a luminosity. And so that suggested to me this, this vision. Um, and not knowing really anything about the artist at all, I just had this this image of of a man and woman who experience something together they experience some kind of vision of themselves together and then the whole story was working backwards from from that that central idea and so for me that's actually the center of the story yeah the 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 the, the words the palette it's very dreamy it's very, very dreamy. The whole story, it's very dreamy. Did this, how long did it take you to write this? Did it just come out? It, I, I sense because the, if you take a bite of the beginning, middle, and end, it's the same flavor, the same color palette, the, 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 the same um, mood. 
it seems to me this is the kind of story which must have come out very quickly all at once. Perhaps not. It did. Yeah, it did. Um, yeah, once once I had the central idea, so writing it, be- it was was the the experience of writing it was was very quick. It it spilled out, and you know, I put a, a lot of my own experiences into the story. Yeah, sure, sure. It's almost like catching the muse, you know, if you if you channel the muse and then you just let it pour out and then it's there and it's done. Um, some of the things that I've written that I like the best, I just float out other things which I labored over and went back and edited and changed the word and then changed the word back and then changed the word and then changed the word back. I think those appear very labored and they <laughs> A lot of times they sucked. So I it was too much of me in it. It wasn't channeling the, the muse and letting the muse, the idea, the concept, the inspiration pour through and then capture the capture that shit on a paper on the page. I shouldn't say shed the the beauty, capture the spirit on the page. When I get involved and start touching it too much, I think I end up ruining things. So I don't know. But I got the sense in this story that it was very uniform, that the feel was the throughout the whole thing. It really, really captured a, a very, very, um, a very nice feeling through the whole thing. So the introduction is it's like you're, you're presenting someone with a, a kind of bittersweet memory. So it, 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 by the ending, the reader has come to the understanding that the, that the narrator slash you has been honest with them. So this is, I think, a success. It's just a wonderful story. I appreciate that. Yeah, my my intent with a lot of these stories is actually to bridge a few different audiences. Um, I, you know, I come at things from, BAP, BAP is a great inspiration. I come at things from a very vitalist perspective. This idea of um, drinking the enchantment of the world, um, and, and being immersed in, in a kind of religious experience that, that just emanates from, from nature, from the reality of things. Um, Mm. and what, what I'm trying to do with, with a lot of these stories is that if I can appeal equally, um, to, to gym bros and uh, you know art art scene women then it's it's a successful story mm, mm, mm. and for this one in particular I I was blown away by people's reactions I had people telling me that it reminded them of a summer romance that they had in 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 the French countryside mm. just one year just you know, a, a season, a season of love, um, that, that happened. Um, and then it was over. Yeah. Um, and it's bittersweet. I, it's bittersweet. I, and, um, you know, I've, I've, I had women who told me that, um, it, you know, it moved them to tears. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think if you can, if you can bridge the gap between some, very different audiences that have commonalities, then that's, that's an interesting challenge and and it can set up uh, a lot of creative tensions. Mm. And you're presenting a character who embodies the, what we believe. Here's a person who's running. This is sun and, and steel or sun and run. Okay. And many of the descriptions when you're dealing with Katharina, you're describing the type of, I don't know, woman that you know feminine as you mentioned before masculine feminine so you're presenting the idea of here is a model of what we believe it's something you know so for people who may not have read other things uh sun and steel or those other other types of building your body exercising get out in the sun go go and live your life you know and uh the joy and and the romance that's out there it's 
it's a great story. You know, it's it's it it touches on a lot of the important themes and points um, of things that you find, ideas that you find on our side of Twitter, but without bashing you over the head with it. It's it's really it's really. I think a, a great successful story. And I'm sure you've gotten a ton of really positive feedback about it, which I, I think is like beautiful and important. I'd like to look at some of the vignettes. Now you've introduced um, in your first vignette, which uh, vignette one, War Explorations of Ephemera. And this is published to Substack on uh, March 27th of this year. And you say the following, and I'm reading, I want to get content into your hands. I feel like I owe you for your expressions of enjoyment and support. And for every week that passes without pushing publish, I feel like I'm letting you down. And I take this very seriously. So I wonder why do artists often feel compelled to produce art as if they owe something to their audience. What do you feel about that? Well, for me, it's two things is one, I want very much to develop as a writer. Um, you know, I said, I, I consider myself a new writer. And so there's challenges that I need to build myself up towards. Um, I'd like to write longer works, more sophisticated works. And there's ways in which I see that my skills right now are, are just not where I want them to be. You know, I read, I read the classics and it's, um, I, I enjoy them, but it, it, you know, I also cry a little bit because, um, I, you know, I want to, I want to equal them. Mm. Um, and that's, um, it's just a desire for for excellence and so i have to i have to push myself and to do that i know that i just need to write more words jack kerouac before he wrote on the road wrote millions of words mm. actually before his first novel before his uh, i think it's called in the town in the country before he wrote his first novel he'd written over a million words and so a lot of these things just come with experience and so Putting in the reps. That's just putting in the reps. This is where it comes into the craft of writing. Mm -hmm. Is that you know we light lightning lightning strikes the muse speaks the the more often you seek her, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if you get used to seeking her, then she's going to come and visit more often. Mm -hmm. um, and so you yeah you have you just simply have to write. Uh, and then the second thing is that um, I've I've been overwhelmed by people's reactions, and I want to I want to give them more. Um, people people ask for it. I don't want to disappoint. So, mm. uh, yeah, that's the idea behind the vignette. So quite short, five hundred, seven hundred words little snippets of stories, character sketches. These are some of the butterflies that you're talking about that arrive, a kind of a, a, a look, a, a, a character, a conversation, a, a, a something, a candy that arrived in your mind and you thought, I would like to explore this a little bit further. Yes. Yeah. I notice that many of them are about war. What is it about war that's attractive for writing? Well, um, or is it attractive? I, is, it, is it is it a war, a warning against it? Well, I have I have a military background that's part of my experience, and I have lots of friends, obviously, who were in the military and still are in the military. Mm. And so, mm. I have personal experience with the American war on terror that the, occurred the in the early. Yes, that occurred in 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 the aughts and in the tens, um, and people. I, I wanted with some of these little vignettes to explore some of the overlooked moments, some of the moments that are not explored in the popular imagination. Um, the experience yes. of going to war is often very boring. 
for for 90 95 percent of the time um but there's actually a lot of interest that occurs there um and the the wealth of stories um you could spend a lifetime telling um and the the absurdities are very interesting to me um Mm. I, I see that whole project of engagement in by the U.S. government in Iraq and Afghanistan as very misguided, even though my personal experiences, I, I found them, I found my personal experience very rewarding in a lot of ways. But, you know, nonetheless, um, you'll see some of these stories are a little bit cynical um they're they're kind of humorous well it's hard to come away from any of it without a degree of cynicism and i think that's one of the things you you in general you come across as a very white pill type person a positive person so it's a sort of a triumph to overcome it yeah the, on a on a tactical level um where the soldier sits there are successes and um and wins and on a the 30,000 foot view, the strategic level, it's just catastrophic failure. So it, it is absurd. There's a sort of absurdism in the entire thing, you know, the, the, the entire thing. So um, I think anyone with a background in, in, in military uh, who has been out there and um, would uh, find these very interesting and familiar. It's one of the things uh, uh, sort of about um and and this is an often discussed concept is that uh, you know you're born in the 1800s and uh, the, or the 18th century sorry the, the 1700s and and you know you you're you're a young man and you want adventure and you can jump on a boat with fernando magallanes and sail the world and go somewhere and do something and have adventure and um and sort of the long house uh, life that or so mo- so many people are living now there's a sense that there is no adventure anymore. And so um, going to war, seeing, uh, you know, spending some time in Mesopotamia and seeing Babylon and seeing the Tigris and the Euphrates River, you know, and having uh, colleagues from, uh, you know, Nineveh and weird places like that, I think uh, is a kind of now a substitute for... um, jumping on a boat, you know, and going across and discovering Central America and hacking your way through the jungle with Cortez and his men. Yes, yes. Um, there's, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just amazing how much we wasted because the, the motivating ethos was 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 simply improper with those earlier expeditions those adventures of colonization there was opportunity for glory and personal gain for a lot of the men involved mm. um but our projects in Iraq and Afghanistan were always conceived as bureaucratic structures. The essentially the the expansion of the bureaucratic state into area into new areas, new territories. Um, the 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 motivating force in Afghanistan once um, the initial mission had had been accomplished to some degree was. Uh, to build schoolhouses and education for for young women, allegedly, or to give them a, a gender reassignment surgery, I suppose. Yes, yes, um, and so there, there's a way where the the whole project, no matter what, is is just going to be doomed to failure because no one stopped to ask if that's what the people there actually wanted, um, and no one stopped to ask. Um, what's actually the benefit to the United States and what's the benefit to the individuals who go there to fight. Um, And so 
it was uh, an enormous misad misadventure. You can see that in the in the fall of the American forces in Afghanistan, the route, essentially the the disorganized withdrawal. Um, I mean, yeah, so was... yeah, some of some of some of these vignettes attempt to explore that. There's there's so many more stories. the the first The first vignette has to do with uh, a State Department girl, really, Hits who goes McGee. to overseas. Yeah, <laughs> I think we've all met uh, Tits McGee. I think yes. we have all met Tits McGee. Yeah, and the and the fish farm, the notional the notional fish farm in the Baghdad mm. desert. Mm. Mm. Which had exactly zero fish in it, I presume. Yes. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was a few, uh, a few scraped trenches, um, and mm -hmm. it would have been maybe more effective to just pour the money directly into the trenches because <clears throat> it was, yeah, as effectively yeah. gone that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's there's humor. You know, these are th these are these are things worth talking about. Um, you know, it's like the soldiers' vernacular the stories that are told over cigarettes um, that makes it worth it on an individual level while you're there is the camaraderie and the humor, the, the black humor. Um, that's what, that's what makes it bearable. Um, but these are things that should be explored from a literary context um, because they expose the, the foolishness of, of the government essentially no no it's the I, I i go back often and uh you know without saying too much i've spent time in both of the places that you've talked about and uh you come back and uh you want to jump on the on the counter at starbucks and you know and say things that no one wants to hear and i i think about uh rutger howard's uh the replicant uh, Roy B Batty, uh, his famous, his famous line: "The things you, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. This whole, this whole thing, you know. You come back and tell people, I, you know, I've seen things you can't believe and couldn't begin to describe. And um, I think writing them down and getting them on paper and um, and sharing them." And not being too heavy-handed about it, you know, ha having a light-hearted uh, view of it is, uh, I think it's a challenge. I think you've navigated this very successfully. Of Vignette 2, Longing for Baghdad. Vignette 3, Search Patterns. Vignette 4, Numberless Herd. Uh, Love Crusade. Hippopotamus. Would you like to comment on any of those? Sure. Um, hippopotamus is a funny story. It's I, I keep an eye out for stories, so it's uh, a story that was related to me that I embellished on a little bit, but the core is essentially true. It has to do with this mad middle son who essentially explodes the social fabric of these uh, very wealthy families in Spain utterly explodes completely, completely explodes. And it's just, it's just so ridiculous what he did um, that this... it just begs exploration. He, he, he's, he's a character who, you know, he deserves actually much more. I'd like to follow him around for a while. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's the trail of tears. He he lives, he leads, he, he he exists at the at the head of a long trail of tears. It's crazy. Yeah, he's he's someone he's someone who marches to the beat of his own drum. Um he's you know, like one of these kind of schizo incomprehensible characters who's touched by the gods in in mm -hmm. some ways and you can you can hate him but also actually many people love him um maybe inexplicably yeah <laughs> he's a folk hero to many 
Um, but yeah, Spain, Spain is interesting to me. It's a, it's a lovely country. Mm. There's a way in which it was preserved in a bottle for many decades mm. under the years of Franco. Um, the middle class prospered, especially the families who are depicted in the story. They're essentially factory owners. Uh, their, their industry was protected. Um, but then when the country liberalized, uh, there was a very accelerated effect where the world impinged on this closed and, and circle with steady patterns of life. And that's very interesting to me. Um, this, this main character, Carlos, um, who does this monstrous thing. Maybe he's emblematic of that is that that disruption. It's I, I think it's such an interesting challenge, you know, if you obviously a guy who drives a uh a sweet and wonderful woman up to the top of a mountain, leaves her and calls her a hippopotamus is a is a villain. But then if you can manage in some way to write this story from his perspective and in a way people come come away from the story sort of sympathetic towards him. It's a wonderful challenge that and kind of Yeah, understand. I tried I tried to leave I tried to leave some room for that. I tried to leave some room for that. I'm sure that if you were, were to expand it there would be a uh, in in his trials and tribulations there would be some rationale finally emerge, you know, for, for what he's done, reason for the things that he's done. It would make sense on some level. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a little bit about life on twitter.com. There's a a celebrated quote which is attributed to Andy Warhol which predicts that of course in the future everyone will be famous for about 15 minutes and you know the quote. So I would argue that the future Warhol predicted then is already behind us. That that idea has already peaked and it's gone. And I think we've come into a time of anonymity. And I think we'll probably be here for a while. So I'd like to ask you a little bit about anonymity in relation to our side of Twitter, which is often referred to as Frog Twitter. So I'll name a few of our anonymous friends. Bronze Age Pervert, peace be upon him. Rog Nationalist, Zero HP Lovecraft. Second City Bureaucrat, Delicious Tacos, Lafayette Lee, West Bestern, The Fury, Aristophanes, Enoch Powell, Athenian Stranger, Thickock, Myth Pilot. Did I forget anyone? Oh, um, let me give a few shout outs here. Um, Plowman's Folly, who's William Wheelwright. Is that uh, his real name? This was a question I wondered. Oh, no, no, no. That's 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 his persona. Sure. Um, Anon. So Dr. Benjamin Braddock then as well, Anon name. Benjamin Braddock, Athenian stranger. Amy Therese, who is a, a scourge for justice. Um, the, 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 the Babar Bra, who keeps a low profile, but is the, the international man of mystery. Um, and many, many others. Um, who I've been so pleased to meet. So Dr. Jordan B. Peterson has, I think, more than once referred to Twitter anons as anonymous troll demons, which is, I think, kind of harsh for a man with a PhD in clinical psychology. What do you think, Paulos? Are we anonymous troll demons? Um. Well, if we're spirits and we're outside the established order, then uh, you know there there is a, a a strictly by definition demonic character to what we're doing. Um, but I, I don't I don't perceive it that way. Um, why anonymity? Ma why maintain anonymity? Anonymity in this era? Why? What's the oh, rationale? It's, it's it's freedom. Yes. Yeah. It's um, one, it's, it's freedom to say what you really think. Mm. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, 
Um, I, you know, I let loose on a lot of the golden calves of the age. Mm. Um, but there's, there's something more there, which is very interesting. Um, it's the opportunity to make a persona. Mm. Um, and on Twitter, you can be anyone you want. Um, you make a character and you live into it. And um, the best ones actually grow into it. And they pursue their individual tastes and they, they grow into themselves as real characters with differentiated wants and desires. Yes. Uh, and that creates interest. The worst would be is if we were all on LinkedIn where no one is anonymous. <laughs> it's the death of everyone. So I think two things is one is that the, the going back to the quote by Andy Warhol, you know, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Well, that's not very long. And two, he didn't say famous for what? Famous for what? So there's no action associated with it. So the fame itself becomes the end. And so you don't do anything to achieve the fame. Fame should be a byproduct or not be a byproduct of work. You have to put in the work. You have to put it out the art. You've got to do something. Be the first at something. Ex discover something. Uh, invent something. You have a body of work. The body of work speaks for itself. It rises up. And then, as you've said, it becomes noticed. So then the artist first, the artist second. And um, I'd like to believe that we're in that time where we've backed away from the Kardashian, like you're famous, but what for what? What have you, what's the art? What have you, what have you done? I don't see anything. And so I would love to believe that we are sort of the, we, we've turned that on its head. And now we're saying, listen, don't look at me. Quite frankly, I want to go to a restaurant with my wife, with my kids, and I don't want to talk to any of you. I don't want to be disturbed by any of you. I don't, I don't want to know you, any of you. Okay. I don't want to be famous. What I want is to produce and I want my art to be noticed. I want to put that in the front and I personally want to disappear. I don't want to exist in your eye as the artist. I don't, I don't want to exist in your mind. I don't want you to think about me or even know my name. So I think that that's one issue, but I also think that there's another thing at play. And I think that uh, there was an interview with Chuck Schumer, who somewhat unbelievably made the statement, you take on the intelligence community and they have six ways from Sunday getting back at you. So my feeling is probably the more pressing issue is that if you pop up on the radar of FedGov, there are consequences and they are severe. And so, of course, I have two words for you, Ricky Vaughn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and the, well, that may be Hillary Clinton and not the intelligence community, but it's hard to say where one begins and one ends. So here's two more words for you, Alex Jones, two more, Tucker Carlson. The list goes on. There's Darren Beatty. Roger Stone, Steve Bannon, Peter Navarro, Congressman Matt Gates got thrown into it. And of course, at the top of the list, Donald J. Trump. So these are people who are not anon. They've uh, popped up on the radar of FedGov, and there's a, an extraordinary price to pay. What is your feeling about this? How long will this go on? Oh, it'll, it'll go on. Um uh many many more years um FedGov is very powerful it's not even if it runs into crises it's not going anywhere easily um so is that what winning looks like is that what winning looks like to be able to be to be yourself without consequences online or is there still value in being anonymous there there's still value in being anonymous because it's it's the creation of personas um and it it allows you to move into this alternative space uh really the realm of myth um where there are these fantastic personalities who can do things uh they have powers that normal people can't access 
Mm. Um, they can receive visions. They can make contact with each other in this alternate universe. Um, they can rally strange forces to their cause. And that was the experience for people in most of human history is that they had a religious component to how they experienced reality. Um, and this had to do with the, the logic of myth. Um, and so even, even if one was completely public with one's own name and identity, they would be cut off from this realm. And that that shows its its limitations and that shows why this alternative realm deserves to exist mm. uh, because that's that's a wonderful thing mm. um and you can exist with the immortals with achilles with the heroes yes and that that's something that's part of the human experience that in modernity we lost because everything was mediated through scientific understanding and the transparent consensuses of liberal democracy where, where everything is done in a completely public manner, but also without mystery. So it provides a certain mystery then. It does. It absolutely does. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that this corner of Twitter that we mutually inhabit is the most interesting place in the world. Mm. And that's why you find very interesting people who eavesdrop here because yeah. this is the only interesting place where where things are being said that are not mm. being said anywhere else. Mm. Um, you know, like for example, go ahead. Uh, uh, for example, uh, an inspiration for me is the ancient city by Fustel de Collange, and I found that because Mark Andreessen. Um, tweeted about it. Um, and what's interesting is that he tweeted about a specific edition, which, you know, led me to believe that it had been specifically recommended to him by someone in the know, essentially. You know, that's not something I can confirm, but, you know, I, I suspect. Mm. And that's, um, that's kind of a miraculous connection is that you have these these titans um uh, who you know they they shake the world with their every step and they're they're billions of dollars but yet every once in a while um they they reach down into the mix of um common experience um and leave something something significant and that's um that's the experience that i had with with reading this book Mm. It's interesting to me. You mentioned um, Kerouac and uh, the idea of Kerouac as sort of the the subversive uh, behavior, go going into jazz clubs and his finger half hacked off, or it, it, going down and and taking drugs and hanging out with the jazz performers and and whatnot. And it's almost like uh, the E Girls and others are kind of day tripping. In the into frog Twitter in a similar way, they sort of the frog Twitter is the jazz bar, the underground jazz club of of today. This subversive uh, no go zone of 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 um kind of like uh, of di dissidence, and uh, there's sort sort of like the where the where the cool kids uh, want to be. So that I, I sense there's a, an element of that at play. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Kerouac is very rich. Um, there was a frog on Twitter, Semmelweis, who wrote um, a yes. short series of essays, which, which was absolutely fascinating. It was published, Kerouac's... I think. Yes. Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah. I, I highly recommend to everyone. Um, I'll I'll dig up the name of the work shortly. Semmelweis on on Kerouac. Um, what are some other things but, that you would 
that you would guide people to look at? What what are some of the greatest hits, things that, that have inspired you from our side of Twitter? Check out this guy, check out this guy, that this writing, other other things that you've seen and 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 recommendations generally. Um I've been inspired by those who are just writing fiction on Substack. Um, when I first started writing, there was um, some individual and I've tried to go back and find him, um, but he was just writing little stories about his day, um, about his job, uh, and, you know, funny anecdotes with his sister. That was, mm. that was very inspirational to me. The minutia um, of the day. Yes. Yeah. Zero, zero HP Lovecraft is an inspiration for me. Okay. Um, seeing, seeing his success and the, the rigor and the effort, which, with which he brings to his work. Um, certainly, certainly BAP was an inspiration. Um, I wrote this piece, um, about the Riachi bronzes and I actually sent it to him. Um, and it took me several months uh, before he actually read it. And he doesn't, he doesn't owe me anything at all. Um, Indeed, but yes. I thought, I thought that he would enjoy it and he did read it. He did read it. And that was actually a, a magical moment for me um, when he read it and enjoyed it and publicized it. Um, Explain BAP to someone who does not, uh, who's not familiar with him. BAP is a figure transported from myth directly into the Twitter sphere. He's someone who has deep and intimate knowledge with uh, the spirit of the ancient Greeks. And he communicates this through his writing, his book, Bronze Age Mindset, and through his persona which is um, irreverent, um, but also very magical in the way that um, the madmen were understood to be touched by the gods mm. in a lot of mm. ways. Mm. Um, and so it, it represents the communication of, of a spirit that has been lost to the contemporary world, mm. but is absolutely electrifying. Hmm. to me it's a <clears throat> he is this very very interesting blend of high low register your college professor that you go out and you're doing cocaines and hanging out with prostates that he can go as far in one direction and farther than the people you're supposed to respect and can go just as far in the other direction. There's something about this blend, which is is very uh it's just you can't touch it, man. It's, it's uh it's it's a, it's a very unusual. It's very unusual. It's it's um it, it's the repudiation. There was a, a famous article written in the aughts about some Harvard professor who had a plumber over his house to repair something. And he realized that he was incapable of speaking with this man. Yeah. He had nothing to connect with him. Um, and so the repudiation of that is an intimate knowledge of um, the, the lower registers of life, being able to go into the seedy districts and connect with the low people. Mm. Um, that's something that Jesus Christ had. Yes. Um, he yes. dined with money changers and prostitutes. Um, and so to be able to do that, but also retain one's ideal and one's orientation on the higher things, mm. um, mm. is, is an enormously productive bridging of, of a gap. It's connecting the high and the low. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, you know, for young men to go and, and gain experience, like deep, gritty, 
dirty experience in a lot of ways is is a very good thing, but mm -hmm. they have to be able to do that and and keep their heads. Yes. Um, so so at this point, uh, I, I just pulled up my my sub stack, and I want to I want to give some shout outs. Um, Let's do it. From from what you asked before, uh, so the Dorian invasion. Um, he goes by Lycurgus on Twitter. He he's very deep, very amazing. Um, what he does is he reads um, the the Greek lawgivers Herodotus, and he gives his own commentaries. Hmm. And they're very lucid, very very accessible. Uh, and he's he's actually published a book. Um, Another one is um, the Carousel. Isaac Simpson. He goes by Disgraced Propagandist on Twitter. He's <laughs> nice. someone who like who goes. Yeah, he's someone who who goes to uh, these interesting places. He wrote an article about um, the social tensions in Montana, huh. which he felt very strongly. And this was this was such a strong article that editors at mainstream magazines like the Atlantic and the New Yorker uh, were just absolutely green with jealousy. They were passing it to each other. And you can tell that they just wished that someone, someone from their editorial no. room had, had written it. Um, he has, he has, or that, or that they would be allowed to publish it. Yes. Yeah. Who else do you have? Um, Abdullah. He, is uh, a Muslim prince hmm. and he wrote a novel uh, Blood of the Levant and okay. so he's he's writing um, another is uh, Bad Billy Pratt yep um, he wrote um, Welcome to Hell yep and he's been in the game a long time he's uh, he's a tremendous writer yes yes it's amazing. What 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 do you recommend for a sensitive young man who has written something and is sitting on it? So I, in in my mind, there's a there's two things, and the Venn diagram of these two things, wherever it overlaps, you have the artist and you have the promoter. Okay, so the artist, without any promotion, is producing things, writing things painting things, sculpting things in their attic alone. And we're looking at uh, Van Gogh. We're looking at uh, Edgar Allan Poe. We're looking at Emily Dickinson. Okay. A body of work. They're sitting on it. And what do you do? On the other hand, you have the, the uh, P.T. Barnum, the, 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 the promoter. And I think in the modern era, you've got to have both. You've got to be able to produce and then you got to figure out what to do with your work. Who, wh wh where do you bring it? What do you do with it? How, how do you get it, eyes on it? Wh what do you think about this? You've, you've had it. You've described an experience where you sent uh, a, a work nemesis off to the Passage Prize. Um, they said, no, thank you. But you did turn around and you won. You were able to get it published in another place. How how do you get eyes on your work? What do you do? What's your recommendation? Yeah, send it send it to people. Um, send it send it shamelessly. Um, you know, people have a lot of demands on their time. Um, send it to me. I'll read it. I'll mm. I'll give feedback when I can. Um, I don't know if I can get to it immediately, but send it yeah. to everyone. Yeah. Send it to Aristo's Revenge okay. on Twitter. Yes. He writes. Um, a literature review on yeah. Substack. Great account. Great account. Um, send it to other writers and just ask, what do you think? Okay. Um, and and it'll get around. Oh, another writer. Another shout out. Yep. Uh, PCM Christ. Okay. He's a friend of mine, and he's writing. Very good, very, very gritty, fantastic fiction. And so, yeah, that's what I would recommend is that. Don't be shy. Um, Send it out. Don't be shy. Don't be shy at all. Um, 
but I would say is um, just just right. Yeah. Um, yeah. If someone if someone has an idea, they should they should sit down and they should explore it. They should write, and then they should also think very seriously about how to improve mm. and how to overcome themselves uh, for the next work. Mm. Steel um, sharpens steel. I think the the sharing it, talking about it, and having a form for that. You know, I think that's critical. I think it's critical. You know, because if you don't have the goods, I mean, you can be a real rapey about your work and push it off on everyone that you meet. But if it's no good, it's no good, and uh, it it's got to be good. I mean, you you have to bring the goods. That's it. So getting better, learning how to get better, and taking criticism, taking feedback, bringing uh, taking it to heart, and then just putting in the putting in the reps, putting the reps, writing, writing writing, writing, singing out, getting feedback, you know, thinking, contemplating, and then get back to your craft, write more. Yes. Yeah. Curtis Yarvin has a vignette that he likes to talk about, which is uh, the communist film writers um, in the 50s, 60s. And they had a brotherhood. They had very thick skins. Um, so even though they were all bound together, uh, by this ideology, they would be very tough with each other. And if an idea was bad, they would, they would say so. And it, it wouldn't get made into a film, um, because yes, they were, they were all reds together, but the most important thing was the art, um, and that had great effects for them. They were they were able to make a lot of films that got past the censors, um, and the films were better for it in a, in in a lot of ways because of that. I, I think censorship is actually very interesting because it forces you to be very smart and and speak on multiple dimensions. Mm. Um, and it, it makes for very layered work. Shakespeare wrote under conditions of censorship. Mm, um, mm. And so it, 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 it's something that aids the complexity of the work. And you can see the opposite effect with the woke screenwriters today. They're, they're just bad because they feel completely free to express their, mo their, express their ideals in, in the crudest terms possible. And it's just not interesting. Yeah, because um, it, it, It's interesting too, because um, they're the uh, prevailing mindset now or the, the, the ruling uh, point of view now, but it, when you're in a writer's room and you don't get any feedback and you make a suggestion, well, let's make the elves this or that. And people are afraid to give you pushback. Well, I don't know if that's a great idea because, well, I'm not going to say anything. They're going to they're going to say I'm a racist or something. So they're not getting any feedback at all about it. So they're just launching the dumbest possible ideas, the most implausible ideas, and um, and it's garbage. So th there is something I think what, what with what you're saying. It's so true. You know, ha having that opposition to your work and having to be clever and smart about it is uh, is is almost a gift. It makes you better. You have to fight. It's a it, struggle. It really is. It's a struggle. the The lives of others uh, deals with that, uh, which is, I think, a great film. And um, in addition to kind of uh, touching on on uh, current topics of Stasi. And being spied on, it's the uh, the whole notion of um, you know writing and saying things without actually saying them, and uh, and and finding a way around. It's, it's I think it's 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 great. It's beautiful. What should we look for in the future? What's happening? What's coming? What's coming for us? What's coming for Paulos at Myth Pilot? What should we expect from you down the road? Yes. Well. More, more work. Certainly, I'm going to continue to write. Uh, I want to, uh, I want to build my life around being able to write. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I'll get there eventually. You but, have a gift. Uh, more broadly, thank you. You have a gift, man. Your writing is incredible. It's wonderful. I, I think that, uh, you know, just put in the reps, that's it. And and you know, and it's a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of pressure. It's like everyone's standing around you like a, a mosquito with their proboscis trying to stab it into your story maker, like a juice box or something. You know, it's a, a you, there's a sense of like, like the, the, hey, back off a little bit. But, you know, people are hungry. They're like, this is fucking awesome, man. When, when's the next one? And like, this ain't McDonald's, dude. This shit takes time. It ain't like, where's the money, Lebowski? We gotta give me a minute. Okay, I gotta give me a minute. Yeah. You know? But uh, uh, I'm, you know, I'm really comforted. I'm really comforted by the fact that um, people only remember your good work. Hmm. It's, um, it's, um, you know, it, you know, it's not like finance. You can't lose someone uh, a billion dollars. I don't know, unless you're a film writer. But um, if if you're a writer, um, yeah, your your mediocrities will fade into obscurity, and people will read your gems. And so, mm. if if that's the dynamic, then um, you know, fire away um, is is how I see it. Yeah, the, what, um, but. What's it? What's the expression? Don't don't uh, don't lose the good for the great. Don't don't um, you know focus 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 on something per- to make it perfect, and you end up just you know losing the opportunity to put out a, a lot of work. You know, sort of bottleneck your own your own creativity. Yes, yes. Um, but going back to the question, um, besides more work, what I see and what I hope I can help contribute to, and I, I do have some some plans to that end, which you know I think I think will be revealed in the future. Um, we've we've just got to build up this alternative world, and in a lot of ways, I go back to the ancient city and what what Fustel de Coulanche identified um, as the process of social change is that the things that bring down an empire are, are really two things. One is loss of belief and loss of unanimous belief in the founding myths of that mm. society. Mm. And two, a class of men who exist outside the system who are, who are dedicated to its downfall in a lot mm. of ways. And when those two elements are present, it leads to a crisis. And what happens during that crisis um, is, if if it's successfully navigated, is a resolution where the founding myths are reforged, and the elements of the founding myth um, that are are agreeable to to everyone in the new configuration are retrieved mm. um, and that becomes the new ideal and the class that was previously excluded is is reintegrated mm. um i you know ideally in the, in a ruling capacity the myth makers yes and so what i see is loss of belief in the myths of of the society's founding that exists already um the left the right um there, there's no commonality the left doesn't believe the right has has started to see that um the left doesn't believe um and they've come to their own understandings and they're searching for new stories essentially Mm. Um, and so that exists already so the second part is simply creating this 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 alternative class and so what we need is, is structures that permit people to 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 live in this alternative world Mm. Um, and really inhabit it in in a deep way and and build it up mm. um, and make it into something more and more real every day. Um, 
and so that that comes with time it comes with money um it comes it comes also just with willingness people who are willing to exist on the frontier in in this difficult space simply because they want to is that that's their that's their temperament yes. um, and so if we can make those ways of life and we can make them durable enough and we can we can build up this this group of people um, into something where it's really substantial and attractive. Yes. Um, where 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 other people are drawn to it and they want to inhabit it too. Yeah. You have then, a choice. Choose this or that. And which is the more beautiful choice? Yes. Yeah. When FedGov comes to arrest Paulo said Myth Pilot, drag him out of his house. He's tanned and ripped and beautiful and smart. And everyone says, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I want. That's what I want to be. Yes. Why they, yeah, that's what? that's the the apotheosis, that's the modern apotheosis when people are doxxed. They uh yeah. they move they move from the 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 realm of um of mortals into and they're fixed in the sky, you know. Mm, mm. You get your own star. Yes. Not on the streets of the Hollywood Walk of Fame either. A more important one. Paulo's brother, man, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I thought we were going to talk for about an hour and we're creeping up on two. So I can't ask for more of your time. I really appreciate uh, this because conversation. This has been so enjoyable. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've, um, I, I really appreciate the, actually the chance to talk about my work a little yeah. bit. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I hope you enjoy it. I hope your readers enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we're all waiting for uh, what comes next. No pressure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No pressure. Thank you, man, so much for your time. And uh, and uh, we'll be in touch. We'll all be uh, waiting for our uh, good morning greeting. And I think that, yes, uh, we just need a few more of us on our side of Twitter. And I, I feel confident that we we are going to win. We are going to win. I appreciate that. Thank That's you. It. Good night. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you.